okay. That's it. I think that's now recording. Okay. Hello and welcome to the first Tetherleys online event and thank you to everyone who is joining us. So I'm Anna McNay, an art writer, editor and curator. And for those of you who are used to attending the Heatherly's Monday afternoon talks, you might remember me um, from the early days when I hosted some of the initial in conversations actually live at the school. Hero has asked me to her ex express her regret that she can't be there to greet you all in person at school this evening with her usual glass of wine. Um, for you all that is, not for her, um, but she hopes that you're all at least sitting somewhat more comfortably at home than on the rickety chairs in the lecture theatre. Uh, before we get started I do also need to remind you that the talk is being recorded and will be put on YouTube and also on the school website. So today I have the pleasure of talking to the award-winning British figurative painter Sadie Lee. Hi Sadie. Hello, um, I just wanted to say how nice it is to do this but also that I'm aware that people might have tuned in um, because they knew that it was two lesbians doing a live video and I just wanted to make sure that no one's got the wrong end of <laughs> <laughs> we are just chatting about art and stuff you know but uh, no it's lovely to be here and really nice to see everybody thanks for coming <laughs> Um, I don't know how to follow on from that. I was, was going to say that Sadie probably needs little introduction, um, but I'm going to give a brief overview anyhow for those of you that didn't read the blurb um, and might be unfamiliar with her work or also because her achievements are generally so impressive that it's worth reading a few of them off. Um, so Sadie's challenging paintings focus on a range of subjects, including the representation of women in art, sexuality, gender and the ageing body. She's been um, included in group shows, including at the ICA London and also at the Museum of London. And she's had solo exhibitions, including the National Portrait Gallery in London, Manchester City Art Gallery, the Schwulis Museum in Berlin, and the Museum of Modern Art in Slovenia. In 2009, two of her paintings were selected for the group show Shout at Glasgow Gallery of Modern Art, alongside the likes of Nan Golden, David Hockney, Robert Maplethorpe and Grayson Perry. In 1996 she won the BP Travel Award which is a major prize at the BP Portrait Awards at the National Portrait Gallery. She's also lectured on her painting at multiple institutions and since 1998 has worked as a freelance art educator at the National Portrait Gallery where since 2007 until actually really recently um, she's also hosted queer Perspectives, which was a quarterly event where she invited an LGBTQIA guest to join her in selecting and discussing works from the collection. Um, Sadie's paintings are in various private collections, including those of television presenter and historian David Starkey, Oscar winning costume designer Sandy Powell, and Hugh Cornwell, the lead singer of the punk band Stranglers. In 1992, Sadie's painting of herself and her then partner was used as the publicity poster for the BP Portrait Awards. Um, in the era of Section 28, when any form of promotion of homosexuality was still illegal, the work received resounding responses from both ends of the scale. So today, time permitting, we are going to get on with this now, we're going to talk about her inspirations for that painting, how her practice has developed since, how her sexuality has helped her career, and also her involvement in art education. Um, so the plan is that Sadie and I are going to talk for approximately 45 minutes, give or take, and then um, I will also be hopefully slide sharing at various points along the way so that you can see her work. Um, and then we will open up to questions, but I've muted everybody as you've come in and um, that's basically just optimize, optimize, sorry, sound quality. Um, so I'm going to ask for people to type their questions into the chat box, which is down the bottom of the screen. Uh, but if you can perhaps do that somewhat nearer to the end, just in case there's any other chat going on and then I'll lose them if they're too early on. Um, but I'll remind you of that at the time. So let's get started. <laughs> um, as I just mentioned, Sadie, your portrait Erect 1991 was used as a publicity poster for the BP Portrait Award. Um, let me screen share that with everyone now. Hang on. Uh, that's, hang on. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah, there we go. 
Right, um, good, okay. <laughs> um, so can you tell us a bit about the image and what inspired it? What, what was the context in which it was made? Yeah, well, it was um, it's quite a long time ago now, obviously. Um, that was me on the left as you're looking at it with the, um, the sort of checked jacket. Um, I had much better posture in those days. I can, can say that. Um, but it was my, uh, a self-portrait with my girlfriend at the time. And um, I have to tell you, it was the first painting that I ever made. Oh. Um, I'd been to art school uh slightly disastrously because i wanted to do kind of installation and um much more conceptual work and i had a, a tutor who really didn't like what i was doing and he was very very negative and um he sort of made me want to leave so i did and um it's one of the biggest regrets of my life but nonetheless that's i thought the end of my art career um and I did anything else for five years, just sort of worked in shops and things. But I got this box of paints that I'd nicked from the classroom when I was leaving the you know, school. And I made this painting with it. And um, it was, I didn't really know what my style would be if I was going to be a painter. So um, I actually had a book that my mum had got me knowing that I loved art. And I looked at these sort of, I looked through it and just thought, well, what do I like? Um, I think actually I've sort of sent some slides to show you. So. Um, this was the book that my mum gave me, which doesn't sound very good, does it? The Joy of Art by David Piper. It sounds, <laughs> it sounds awful. Um, but it actually is a really, really good sort of collection with quite a broad range of people. And in it um, was uh, Otto Dix, who's a kind of um, Neue Zackerkeit artist who painted this painting. So that, that picture was in this book. Um, and as was uh, American Gothic by Grant Wood, this one. And I kind of, I loved them. There was just something about the formality of them and the sort of slight exaggeration and the thinness of the paint. And I just thought, if I'm gonna do it, I really, I, I like the feel of that. So in a way I kind of mashed them up um, and, and sort of used, you know, likenesses of myself and my girlfriend, but I kind of wanted to get that feel. And I think if you look back at Erect, you can kind of see what I've slightly um, sort of nicked. Um, but my girlfriend collected 1930s clothes. She had a, a stall. Um, in Greenwich so she actually had these outfits and we did used to stomp around London looking like that but also it was the time when lipstick lesbians were all the rage so the reason we keep seeing those images on the screen of um, oranges are not the only fruit which is the tv adaptation based on Jeanette Winterson's um, sort of autobiographical story and um, portrait of a marriage which obviously was a story of uh, the love affair between um, Violet Trefusis and um, to Sutfield West. This was on the telly in 1990 and like everybody else I just hoovered it up even though it was sort of like um, period drama you know kind of romp um, that was just somehow sort of titillating and fitted in with the whole lipstick lesbian thing. There was a bit of a phase of that where you just couldn't turn the telly on without seeing two generally straight women at it just to kind of be fashionable and usually for the presumed sort of um, enjoyment of a male viewer so I kind of in in, in amongst all this and section 28 um, being an absolutely abhorrent clause that had come in um, in 1988 which basically um, made it you know punishable um, and forbidden to make anything which was could be construed as being a positive image of um, you know same-sex love um, I sort of all this rolled into me wanting to do something that was about a real relationship but also kind of reference the climate at the time. So were you looking to create imagery that other young LGBTQIA people could um, relate to because there wasn't anything? I mean you've just mentioned two obviously television things that were available or was it purely something personal for you? Well, I think although there was all this stuff on the telly, which felt a bit like um, slightly voyeuristic, um, there was very little. I mean, remember, this is pre-internet. You know, can you imagine a time when, when you know, there really wasn't anything? You, you, you had to sort of look for things in something called a book. Uh, so, you know, I, I felt that I wasn't able to find representations of myself or things that I could relate to. So I suppose it came out of a need to... Um, present an image that represented a real relationship, an actual relationship. Um, you know, there's something about kind of the historical nature of these television programmes, you know, the portrait of a, of a marriage was about the sort of Bloomsbury set from the, you know, 
early 20th century. And somehow it's kind of, it had gained um, almost kind of a tasteful element to it because it was, it was from the past. And I kind of wanted to do something that was contemporary, but referenced that fascination with the kind of, you know, the sexy Weimar old days and the, you know, in, in between wars period when it was kind of almost acceptable and bring it up to date. Um, but, you know, because there was nothing available, um, just like other queer people, you know, do in, in their everyday experience, I would take things that weren't meant for me and I would somehow kind of make them okay and rebrand them as belonging to me. I'd reclaim them. So, um, for example, the, the image that we've got of um, Helmut Newton. Um, I don't know that I would really sort of like Helmut Newton as a person. Um, he was regarded in an in a article in The Guardian as um, the king of kink. Um, he was sort of thought of as being someone who was quite possibly misogynist and cruel and, you know, his work was kind of bordering on pornographic. And there was a, you know, sort of stories about the way that he treated his models. And this was sort of based on his kind of fantasies. But actually, I loved these images. You know, I kind of was able to separate the images from who had created them and who they were supposed to be for. And I took them and, and had them as my own. So I put them on my wall. And in a way, I kind of was, you know, my painting was almost like a love letter to these, this sort of imagery. I borrowed an awful lot from them. Um, they're, they're part of a sort of triptych series and there's another one where it's the it's sort of garçon, you know, the kind of masculine attired um, woman with an, a nude, a female nude, sort of in an inappropriate outdoor setting. And I kind of borrowed that, you know, sort of format in my own work and sort of referenced it, but then twisted it and made it sort of more personal. But, you know, you did take what you could get and then um, sort of it goes through the filter of you and then comes out sort of somewhat queered, if you like. So how important do you think it is, not just for, for people who are LGBTQIA to have something to see that reflects themselves, but also for, for heterosexual people to have that imagery around them? Absolutely, I, I think it's, um, it's vital. Um, and I, I feel really fortunate in that I, I think somehow I've managed to kind of straddle both camps where, um, you know, I obviously have work in shows that's specifically about sexuality and gender. Um, that's the theme. Um, it's kind of based on human rights issues as well. But at the same time, I've shown my work in quite sort of prestigious traditional museums and galleries. And in a way, you get the kind of endorsement of that. Um, gallery. I mean, the, the painting that we were looking at, Erect, was actually used as the promotional image for the BP Portrait Awards in 1992. And if you can imagine, I mean, that really, really austere building, the National Portrait Gallery, on the railings outside, it was all my poster. You know, it was just everywhere. In those days, I just used one image for all of the promotion. Um, so it was, made, it was, you know, in shop windows, it was in um, books, it was in magazines. And it was made into a poster that was shown on every single London Underground station in the whole of Greater London. And actually, it was defaced terribly. There was awful graffiti on it. Um, there was the usual things that you can imagine if you, you're sort of looking at the image and the placement of our hands, you can imagine the sort of things that people were drawing on there. And it was called erect, so I was kind of asking for trouble. Um, and there was like hitting the moustaches and things that you might expect. But actually, people engaged with it. And so they would, um, it was quite pale in the background. So there's a lot of room for people to write things and they would say, what is this? Um, and somebody wrote, is, uh, is this men or women? And um, why is this man wearing a dress? And at first I was quite upset about it. And then I realized that it had provoked people to look at it and consider what they were looking at and then actually sort of want to engage in some sort of dialogue about it. And I just thought that was amazing. Um, in fact, there was a there was a TV program made about it. Um, very short little magazine program. Um, there's a, a show called Out on Tuesday, which was in the early days of Channel Four, and um, they they did, had a section where they they went round with a camera and filmed the poster as it was kind of you know defaced in every single station. And I, I'm still trying to track that down. I remember seeing it at the time. It's probably in the BFI archives, but. I'd love to see it again now, but yeah, I, I took it as a compliment. <laughs> okay. 
So um, after that, let me just move to the next image. Um, you started to find your own style and also your own subject matter. So this painting, Raging Bull, is from just, it's just a year later. Um, can you talk about, about this and where the idea came from? Yeah, um, this was a, sort of a portrait of someone who I really admired from afar and um, was a little bit nervous about talking to them and managed to kind of um, have a reason to talk to them by asking them if they would, if they would sit for me. Um, and it's kind of, an, uh, they really look like this. So um, it is a kind of realistic depiction of, of someone as they look, but I've kind of exaggerated it a little bit and um, obviously sort of stage managed it to resemble the uh, publicity still of Marlon Brando from um, Streetcar Named Desire. Oh which are very handily gone. <laughs> so, um, so Marlon Brando is, you know, I suppose the kind of um, epitome of the brooding sort of, um, you know, glowering masculine male. And by kind of um, replicating the pose, I was really sort of exploring the idea of mascul masculinity, not necessarily just being for men. Um, and, uh, you know, that things that we associate with masculinity, like, um, physical strength and being a leader and being sort of you know um a hero and sort of you know all, all of the things that we think of as being masculine are not necessarily something that can't be applied to anyone um so it's kind of an exploration of that it was also just a kind of sexy um homage to the butch um and uh it was used i've got my my image here on the cover of female masculinities um by Edith Halberstam, uh, now known as Jack Halberstam. So I've got my signed copy here. I just wanted to read what Jack said because actually that's probably even better than anything that I could say. Um, so I don't use words, I, I do pictures instead of speaking. Um, but uh, Jack had said, uh, Raging Bull by British artist Sadie Lee generates a connection between the spectacle of boxing and the spectacle of the fighting butch. The painting confronts us with the hard stare of a bull dyke, a powerful and built body that is not obviously female, but that is obviously not male. The face has no facial hair and the chest gives a hint of bound breasts. Um, the bull dyke's arms are folded in defiance and they are disproportionately large for the body. Uh, and then it says, um, the image challenges the viewer by staring straight out from the canvas and fixing the viewer within the butcher's gaze, which I absolutely love. And what an honour um, to be you, you know, to, to have it used in that way on this like essential text on um, masculinity without men. I think if anybody hasn't read that book, it's a really, really good one to have on your bookshelves. And um, I'm thrilled actually at having that connection. Brilliant. So the same year, um, you also painted this striking image, Butch on a chemise, um, which was inspired by Picasso's Femme on a chemise. Um, yeah, what did, what did you want to say or capture within this painting? Um, well, I sort of touched on it talking about um, Raging Bull and that it was somebody who I kind of admired and didn't dare speak to. I'm, I kind of refer to these as my sort of art stalking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, how I used art to try and pick up girls um, because um, I've, I've said before that I think in a way I kind of look for a living um, actually so much of my work is about looking um, and about really really looking but um, at the time that I made these uh, I would go out on the scene and I'd, I'd usually go to clubs and bars on my own I'd go to the bell and I'd go to you know ace of clubs and um, places like this on my own and I just look at women who I would never dare talk to and this was somebody who I admired from afar for years um, and I knew what her name was and I, I just would never have dared go up and talk to her and then one day I think I just got a little bit tipsy and something in me made me say would you sit for a painting and then we had this really amazing awkward moment of her coming to a studio and you know me sort of trying to kind of get down some sort of image and take photographs of her I was really shaking um, but then what I did was I got her to look into my camera and look, you know, at me while I was drawing with kind of longing. Um, and then I could capture it. And then I got that, uh, whenever I wanted it. And, um, I had it hanging in my 
in my um, flat for quite a long time and somebody once asked me what it what it was and I said oh it's my girlfriend and they said um, oh you know what's the name I said no it's not of my girlfriend it is my girlfriend <laughs> um, you know I kind of had almost like a relationship with it and um, yeah I uh, the title came from the Picasso portrait, but um, actually I, I didn't really know that painting until after I'd made this. So it's almost a coincidence that there's so many similarities between them. Um, but the blue uh, was very much kind of almost an emotional feeling that I got from this person. It's this sort of icy, cold blue and this intense stare was kind of it's a, it is an exaggeration it's almost like a caricature of this person but she is kind of recognizable but it's it's the first painting that i sold um and it's quite early on in my career and it was bought by um sandy powell Voila. and there she is in front <laughs> of it um only last week she was modeling for um moschino and she uh she did a, a posted this of her um, obviously recreating the pose and said that she never tires of the painting and you can't really see it there but she just painted her wall and it's a really tangerine color and the blue against that tangerine is just amazing it really really sings so she's someone who i i massively admire if you don't know who she is she's um the oscar winning costume designer and she's won baftas as well um, she was a friend of uh, Derek Jarman. She actually works on the film Caravaggio and she was responsible for um, almost single-handedly actually raising the funds required to keep Prospect Cottage um, from being sold off to developers. She, she had this amazing suit and got people to sign it. But she did the costumes for so many amazing films, including um, Carol um, and Far From Heaven and The Favourite. Uh, so to have someone like that, you know, um, by your work and love it and still love it after all these years it's just um I'm, I'm really really thrilled and grateful to her you know um what an amazing person <laughs> brilliant you then decided that you wanted to create something re referring to the night so something that was both or had both sexuality but also sensuality to it and also a sense of wariness so lighting um became increasingly important to you in your work and you started a series which is called Pin Ups. Um, we're skipping forward actually quite a bit here because this painting of Jean Kemp is from 2013, but it was, um, yeah, it's a really striking use of light. Can you talk a bit about how, how you go about setting up the composition for this and how do you get the light to fall where you want it? Are you, are you working, do you take photographs or are you actually, how, how tell me, Tell me about it. Okay, well, um, this actually relates to a series that we're going to look at later on. So I, I might talk about the pose um, okay. uh, later on when, we're, when we, you can compare them. But um, the lighting is something that it's become increasingly important to me. Um, and yeah, I, I think that um, I, I try and get a kind of atmosphere in my work, certainly now. And you can tell how different this is from Erex, which was very sort of daylight lit. It was very flat light. Um, very sort of thin paint and now I'm sort of building it up and looking at the contrast and you know the the sort of shadows that are created behind it 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 becomes sort of there's a there's a threat threatening presence to it um, but the figure tends to be quite defiant within that so I'm sort of playing with different ideas of sort of um, you know kind of perception of who this person is and whether you should be scared of them and you know whether they should be scared of you but just to get that look um i sort of i'm not i'm not a professional photographer at all but i do i work from photographs just so i can kind of keep a likeness but also because i'm i'm making um the situation where we're posing very very dark in order to get this kind of look so you can imagine it's an incredibly dark room and then it's uplit so there's a light coming from underneath to make that shadow sort of hit on the forehead and i literally just have sort of various lamps i've got some kind of photographer's lamps so i've got kind of angle poise type lamps that i hold in different places until i get the right look um, and i wouldn't really be able to sort of construct that and then paint from life um you know really be able to see what i'm doing so i take these photographs um and this was actually um my friend's mum uh, and we, we sort of did it around at um, my friend's house and she was really game, really up for it. And she'd had some surgery, so she's got like big scars, um, which I really, I love the way that the light, the raking light 
coming from the side kind of catches every single blemish. So it's almost a celebration of the history of what her body's gone through. Um, and I just find it kind of sexy and powerful. Great. So is, is this from the same series, Scarlet Woman? Now this is actually a really recent painting. So um, obviously I've been at this quite a long time. It's, I just thought maybe we should have some slightly more recent ones. And this um, is of Scarlet Cannon, who uh, was a kind of 80s icon, it girl. Um, you know, she was like an influencer before we even had influencers. She's, she worked on the door of all the famous clubs. Um, she was a model, she was on the cover of loads of magazines and she had this very distinctive look, she's very androgynous. And there was a show in Liverpool um, through a couple of curators called Duovision um, who uh, had a show that was all about Scarlet because so many artists have made images of her over the years. Andrew Logan's made a sculpture, Felix Dupolsky um, did painting, she's been in all these magazines. So um, <clears throat> this was a, a new painting that was commissioned by them for that show. Uh, so I went and met Scarlet and um, and we recreated this and it, it was kind of quite collaborative you know she was really really up for it but she's so striking and I just had to explain to her that the way that I light it is going to make her look 400 years old um, like she's been sort of exhumed um, but she she completely got it she knew my work and um, she didn't she wasn't vain about it or anything she just saw it as a piece of art and and that it was removed from her which was brave and you know made for a much better image yeah. I think um, whilst you're talking a bit about your process, we've got some images here of actually a work in progress. Can you talk through a little bit? Yeah, I thought people might be interested because um, you never see what's underneath the top layer and um, my paintings are finished to quite a tight finish um, and you wouldn't know the sort of all the different stages and layers that go on underneath it. So um, this is a, a painting of someone called Anne Derrida Cherville um, and it was for a a festival in um, Liverpool called Homotopia in 2011. That was a, another commission working with them. But you can see, so I took photographs of her in my studio, but I thought you might be interested to see the photograph that I was working from because my drawing from it isn't an exact replica of it. And people think that my work looks quite photographic and I suppose to an extent it does, but it doesn't really look like the photograph that I'm working from. It's almost a kind of stylized approximation of it and I keep the photographs so I retain a likeness but I'm not doing a portrait of a photograph. So I've kind of changed it, you can see I've moved her face round a bit, um, I've filled it out a little bit and um, I've decided to crop it so it's kind of changes the nature of it from the photograph but I use green as an underpainting. Um, I use quite thin layers of paint built up um, one over the other, sometimes they're kind of wet and wet or sometimes I'll let it dry and then I'll sort of build on top of that. So I put down a green layer um, the white is just because I took a photograph at the end of each working day and I, I sort of almost had to chop it into bits of what was manageable. So um, it wasn't for any sort of technical reason other than I just ran out of time. But if you want to go on to the next um, slide. So I sort of draw it out either in charcoal or pencil and then I'll sort of use a wet brush to kind of put in a bit of tone and then I'll put in this green layer. Um, sometimes I use like almost an outline of umber just to retain the lines that I want to keep. Um, and then I start blocking in with mid-tones, just quite flat layers of colour. And then I start putting in the dark areas. So once I've kind of established a kind of mid-tone overall painting, I'll start looking at the darkest areas and not putting any of the lights in until a very light stage. So it's kind of quite blocky. And as it sort of builds in layers, it becomes a little bit tighter. But you can see it's darker than I want. Um, and it's sort of gradually kind of building up, getting a little bit tighter focus in each layer, putting in the background so that you're not trying to cut in background around the hair. So the hair's not finished, I'll put that in and then leave the hair till the end. And then you'll see the finished painting in the next slide. Yeah, amazing. Do you have a routine generally for working? Because how do you fit it all in alongside your teaching, event hosting, being a parent? Uh, with great difficulty. Um, I, I spin a lot of plates. Uh, so it's it's quite difficult, um, especially at the moment, um, because I'm in a house with um, an eight year old and, you know, he's uh, not able to go to school and then I can go and do painting while he's doing that. So um, I haven't actually been able to make anything um, since March, uh, which is really frustrating. 
but usually yeah i just have to allocate certain times um and just it's usually the thing that i do at the end of you know everything else so anything that i'm kind of doing like teaching or anything has to be a priority and then kind of fit it in um, but when i get in there i love it do you have a like a, a specific studio routine do you, do you work in silence do you have the radio on um i just ha i have to be quite adaptable just because my life is you know i shoehorn a lot in um i've got a studio that's about um a mile away from where i live uh it's great to be able to actually go to work although when i painted from home in the 90s i'd made a lot more work than i do now because it was always there and i could always work on it but in a way it's quite nice to be able to make something and just leave it there set up and it's ready you know and you kind of feel a bit more professional about sort of actually leaving your house and sort of you know going to work um i love to have music on i don't find it a distraction um i i sort of yeah so in a way a lot of my paintings i can remember what i was listening to when i was painting it painting it's almost like a soundtrack to the to the images mm. and is that influenced by who you're painting as well um i don't know i mean i i have quite eclectic taste um, I'm quite old fashioned, as you probably noticed. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I go through different phases, but um, yeah, I like to, I, I find it really um, gets me into a particular zone. Uh, just having that, you know, music is very atmospheric and it kind of creates the right headspace for things. Um, yeah. Okay, we need to talk about the BP Portrait Awards a bit more. Um, obviously, we've already talked about. Um, erect but you were also in in 1990 let me get this right 95 is that correct with two ladies yeah i've been lucky enough to be in it um i've been selected six times and i've won two of the awards um so it really was something that very much helped me so um the one that i that you just had on the screen before um was in 95 i'm still sort of at that point using paint quite tentatively and it's quite sort of you know daylight lit and i was kind of still going for that very formal mm -hmm. um kind of arrangement of the figures um i started to kind of build and get a bit bolder and start to move away from that and you know um think about the lighting a lot more in 96 i made the um painting which was another of my <laughs> slight art stalk paintings um of someone that i i uh, sort of wanted to have some kind of intimacy with um someone I, I admired very much um and this again was another collaboration because we we talked about it in advance about what we were going to do and um it's kind of playful but it's also um it's about the use of the word flesh as a color as a as a you know name for a color and um you know you get flesh colored paint which isn't the color of anybody's flesh it's like a weird salmon pink color and flesh colour tights is, you know, sort of, it's very, uh, excludes an awful lot of colours of flesh. Um, so we were sort of thinking about how inappropriate it was to have something that's salmon pink called flesh, but then it just became about femininity and, um, you know, the restrictive nature of some of the things that um, women are expected to wear. And um, it just became a playful thing that we would we were sort of, um, looking at what we could do with it um but it is also a portrait of a real person um and she kind of liked the very serious deadpan nature you know with something that's almost kind of comical but when i got this into the bp portrait award um when you get selected for that exhibition everyone that gets in can then apply for the travel award which is a, an additional award that you have to write a kind of um you know a, a kind of paper on what you would do and um i wanted to go to america to paint women who had been burlesque dancers in their in their youth but who were now sort of retired um and mostly in their 70s and 80s and i and i won it so i got to do that and is that where the next picture came from um sorry hold on i don't know what i've done there oops There had to be a hitch somewhere. <laughs> it's the... Um, can you see the screen? Can you see my slides? No. No, it's the uh, older woman um, with a red dress on. Yeah, I know. Sorry. I've just put the slides back to the start. Sorry, guys. Um, 
don't know how to view. Oh, okay. Sorry. While you're doing that, Anna, I'll just um, mention that um, <laughs> it's a, a burlesque museum. Oh, there you go. Keep talking. There's a burlesque museum that I, I saw it on the television. Um, Jonathan Ross was doing this program about Americana and sort of, in a way, kind of sending it up. Um, it's very tongue in cheek. And one of the um, things that he showed was this museum in the middle of the Mojave Desert um, that was run by this woman, um, Dixie Lee Evans, there she is, the Marilyn Monroe of Burlesque. And she was in her 70s. And she was just living in this um, like shack in the middle of nowhere uh, off Route 66 in, you know, like 110 degrees heat that was full of like, um, you know, um, the shoes of somebody who used to, you know, he was called Patty Wagon and the um, feather boa of Helen Bed. And, the, you know, it was all these like artifacts to do with burlesque. And um and she, she just ran it and you could go there and have a look around and see all these things. And I just thought, what an amazing story this is. So I went out there and she introduced me to about 15 other women and I made portraits of them. And then it was shown as a, a one person show at the National Portrait Gallery in the, alongside the BP Portrait Award of the following year. So um, that, was, that was an amazing experience. Yeah. I'm very aware that we have been talking for quite a while already um, and we've got quite a lot more to get through, but I want to touch very briefly upon the fact that um, through the, your inclusion in the BP Portrait Award, that's how you got into doing art education, so initially at the National Portrait Gallery. Yes, um, I, when I won the Travel Award, part of the award is that you then work with the education department um, initially on your own work. So I ran workshops um, while the exhibition was up, which was, you know, for three months usually. Um, and people would come and we'd have a model and they'd sort of, you know, draw things and we'd play the stripper music in the background while, you know, um, and it was really great. And I got on really well with the education team and they invited me to then look at the collection and sort of run workshops on things of my choice. And um, so I chose things that were slightly unusual, I suppose, for the subject of a workshop. Um, I do it on sort of Paolo Rego's uh, drawing of Germaine Greer or on the um, Charles Bichel portrait of uh, Radcliffe Hall or the Gluck self portrait, those kind of things. And sometimes they'd have to get these things out of a box, you know, because they weren't, um, although they were part of the collection, they weren't always on the wall. And um, we actually got quite an interesting um, group of people coming to these workshops, some of whom weren't the kind of people who'd ever come to the gallery before, or certainly not on a workshop. And the gallery noticed that actually they're, you know the sort of uh, range of people that were coming was slightly different and um and so they invited me to do more work and i, I kind of never left so uh, yeah that's how it, that's that's how all that got started and that was how queer perspectives was born yeah queer perspectives um which was oh i loved it so much um we did it for 13 years and Run. a lovely thing it really was um it, it started out as a sort of gallery tour Basically, um, originally it was me and Sean Levin, who's a, a writer and he was the editor of Chroma Journal. Um, we, it was just us and a handful of people wandering around the gallery sort of going, oh, I like that, you know. Um, and we'd sort of have very personal sort of stories about it. And it got, as it became um, part of the programme, uh, we did it every three months and um, Sean couldn't do it anymore so I did it by myself and, and invited a different guest each time. So it was a guest who identified as LGBTQIA+, um, who I invited to look at the collection and then choose things and we'd discuss them. Um, and it became so popular um, that you know, we were getting hundreds of people turning up and they couldn't see things and they couldn't hear and you know, but they just wanted to be there. So we started doing it in the lecture theatre. So not only could people sit down and they could hear what we were talking about, but we then had the um, choice of the whole of the MPG collection and beyond, you know, they might have some personal thing they wanted to talk about as well. Um, and it just meant that um, we weren't having to look at the same images that were literally hanging on the wall each time because the collection doesn't, you know, the hang doesn't change much and we were running out of things. But the thing itself didn't necessarily have to have a queer connection. The queer bit was the guest. Um, because as you know, uh, you know, LGBTQIA plus people 
are interested in things other than their sexuality, you know, and they use a gallery all the time and they might be interested in the way that something's been painted or, you know, uh, for, for many, many stories behind the images. So um, it, it kind of was for everybody, but um, it might have been particular interest to people from that community. Right. And why has it come to an end? Just because it's had such a good run and you couldn't think of who else to invite? Or? <laughs> no, no, I've got a great big uh, list of people who um, I hadn't managed to see yet. Uh, the National Project Gallery has closed now for three years um, for refurbishment, um, which was going to happen anyway, but obviously it was brought forward by, you know, the sort of upside downness of, um, of how the world is right now. Uh, and so that was the end of that. And we were going to have a, a big celebratory goodbye to Queer Perspectives on the 1st of May. And my guest was going to be planning to rock, who I was really, really looking forward to seeing what they've got uh, to say and might have managed to get them to do a little bit of some performance or something. But alas, we weren't able to do that. So, yeah, Queer Perspectives in that format is no more. Um, and there's no record of it because you kind of had to be there. It, it wasn't recorded. Um, it was part of it that we decided to make it only a live event because if it had been recorded, people would think, oh, it's raining. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll go to the next one or I'll look at it online. But actually being there was part of it. And it really felt like an important place to be. And, you know, there were awful things that happened over the run. We, we'd have evenings that were very close to some nasty world events that were happening. And sometimes it felt like a real place of refuge for people to look around and see people who were like them and have that shared sense of who we were. Um, it felt very supportive and nurturing. And I, I will really miss that actually. And I'm so grateful to, especially Fiona Smith who ran that program and made sure that it stayed as a regular fixture. Um, yeah, it was a lovely thing. Oh. Okay, coming back to your painting, um, you mentioned before, well, we mentioned before about how you painted a lot of people who are performers or who are in used to being in in the public gaze. Um, this again is from the Pin Up series. What is it that draws you to to doing this? Do you, does it make it easier for you in a way, or easier for them because they're used to being looked at, or does it make it more difficult because they're more used to being looked at and therefore able to challenge your gaze? Well, this um, series is called Pin Ups, and you'll notice the similarity with the portrait of Jean Kemp that we looked at before because she was a kind of later addition to this. The pose is actually taken from um, an image of David Bowie on the inside gatefold of Aladdin Sane. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of portrait where he's kind of leaning back and got his arms back. So I, I took that, and obviously, Pin Ups is the name of another David Bowie album. So there's quite a Bowie theme going for this. Um, it was commissioned by Homotopia, which is a, a queer charitable organization that has a festival um, in Liverpool. Uh, so I made this series of portraits for a show there um, at the gallery in Liverpool with Duo Vision. Um, and we've got here um, Stav B, who's a club promoter and um, a performance artist and artist and amazing person, mixer of drinks. Um, Frank Sweet on the top there in the in the little black dress, who's a life model, um, and uh, Rita Tushingham, who was in A Taste of Honey, and of course David Hoyle down at the bottom, who's just a legend, um, artist, performer, and um, all-round wonderful being. Uh, I do tend to work with performers. Um, what I do is quite theatrical and I, I tend, tend to sort of get people to do something. So often I'll have had an idea for a painting and then I kind of almost cast it um, and ask someone to, to kind of do that. And although it is a likeness of them, um, there is a sort of performative element where they're kind of playing the part of themselves. I find that performers, because my paintings aren't sort of traditionally pretty, I'm not sort of trying to flatter them, you know, I actually kind of seize on the imperfections because it makes more contrast, it makes things more interesting to paint. Um, not everyone can take that. So often if somebody is used to kind of being a character or, you know, they're, they're from that kind of performance world, they don't take it as personally, you know, they, they just see it as kind of um, like they were playing the part of something. So uh, I feel that like I can kind of push them slightly further than I might be able to. Uh, Rita Tushingham uh, was very 
brave and up for it because I treated her the same way as everybody else. And she's used to being, you know, probably shot through, you know, a, a load of gauze and, um, you know, her sort of the way that she works is very different from someone from the, you know, sort of queer club world, but she allowed me to do exactly what I wanted to do, just like everybody else. And she was a real, yeah, total trooper and, you know, hero of mine. Brilliant. Okay, very quickly still. In the spirit of collaboration, and because we really have to mention it because it's something that we collaborated on together, um, there was an exhibition, um, three artist exhibition threesome in 2018 alongside Sarah Jane Moon, who will of course be familiar to Heather Lee's students, and Roxana Halls with me as the invited curator. And so it was first shown in New Art Projects um, shortly after Tate Britain's Queer British Art closed and part of the idea was to provide a continuation of that with contemporary queer women painters who remain generally quite unseen um, even today and who were not included in the Tate show because the cutoff point being 1960. So you Sarah Jane and Roxana the idea was to paint a portrait of so you each painted a portrait of each other and also a portrait of yourself and then also a nude portrait of the queer performance artist Ursula Martinez. Um, so these are your three portraits. So Sarah Jane on the left as you're looking at the screen, yourself in the middle, and then Roxana on the right. Um, and obviously the title threesome was deliberately provocative, um, but your, your works, I think it's fair to say, out of the three artists involved are three the sexiest. <laughs> Can you say a little bit about again you very much use of lighting sexiness but what what were you basing these on you think they're sexy <laughs> don't you <laughs> sexy awkward <laughs> sexy awkward okay yeah um well i mean i was sort of referencing sex obviously in them but i think they're actually particularly my one is like really really frumpy in my old baggy old pants and you know crepey old legs in the label sticking out the back of my bra I kind of wanted it to be you know almost the I don't know the opposite of you know something that was stylized and made to look kind of really erotic it's like the reality the grim reality <laughs> of what that would look like <laughs> um the, the most exciting thing about that exhibition and I loved that exhibition I have so much respect for Sarah Jane and Roxana I loved their work anyway so I was absolutely thrilled to be part of this it was really great but the most exciting thing was that we didn't see the work until the private view so we would sit for each other and then we'd go off privately and sort of get on with it you know we'd have made studies and got what we needed and then there was a reveal about 10 minutes before the public walked into the show and we had no idea what was coming so um you know we all just stood there with our mouths open and then we suddenly had everybody flooding in and you know it was quite an experience you know to work like that so again that was it, there was something kind of performative about it um it was exciting and daunting and yeah really a, a different way of doing it um, to be honest now what what do you think of what was your response when you saw these two paintings of you um i kind of was really surprised it's it's odd being painted so i think it's a really good thing for artists to do because you put people through this you know and you i think it's a good idea to know what what they're going through um i recognize myself in them it's different elements of me it's odd to kind of hand yourself over to someone else and let them just do whatever they're going to do based on your face um, I love my hair and boots in Sarah Jane's one I think um, and it looks like my hand the features I felt didn't look the way that I think I look so um, I think that sometimes Sarah Jane's her work isn't necessarily about getting a real likeness but I you know my eyes are much more sort of hooded and baggy and my nose is much more blobby than that so I kind of um, yeah it's like a sort of younger me um, but I love the sort of concept of it and the chair and everything. Uh, Roxana's is just beautiful and references all sorts of kind of lesbian characters from films. The light on the skin is just out of this world. Um, I, I think they're, they're beautiful and very different from each other. And it just shows how hard it is to kind of get somebody in one image you know, because I did my own one and, and that again is completely different again. So th there isn't ever one version of somebody. 
Um, there's always different sides and whoever's eyes you're looking through, that person's going to look completely different. And I think it's amazing to get a different thing that you can then compare and see what they were looking for and looking at. Okay. Okay, finally, before we move on to questions, um, just wanted to end with something that's relatively up to date. So from this year, <coughs> this new show, and show Don't Tell series, um, where you're working from found objects. Can you say anything about that? I mean, th these are complete images. They're not details, right? These are the paintings. Um, they really do look like that. They haven't got a white border around them, actually. Um, I don't know why they do in this. I should have cropped them differently. But um, they are just up to the edge of the canvas. So the white border is extra. Um, I did a series of paintings for a queer um, art exhibition called um, Urban Myths uh, for G-Fest. And I made quite... Um, explicit paintings um, using uh, pornography from the kind of 1960s and 1970s. And I, I put these figures from the porn images into these beautiful sort of Francoise Boucher mythical backgrounds with kind of cherubs and things. And they, they really, nothing was left to the imagination. They were very, very graphic. And I found it difficult to show the work when I was trying to promote it in like Facebook or anything like that. I had to crop to a detail because otherwise it wouldn't, it would have been banned from all the social media platforms. So I ended up doing little discrete details just so that I could get it around all the, you know, censorship. And then I realized I liked the details more than the full picture and I wish I'd done it like that. So what I decided to do for these was actually just almost because um, these are from a this these are all from one image which was a very very explicit pornographic image so i'm looking at images of women together from the 1970s primarily and i'll find a, a pornography shot that was just in some magazine or something and then i'm reframing it and just taking details that um leave something to the imagination and in a way i'm putting back the romance um because you fill in the blanks so it's suggestive of some intimate gesture or something that's happening but it's just off off screen you can't quite tell and so depending on what your fantasies are or what, what you imagine is going on you have to kind of fill in the gaps and I liked that element of sort of longing and it not being everything given away at once it just it it made it somehow more romantic and more intimate um, and also it's great if I could do painting right now this would be great lockdown art because obviously I can get these images from the internet because I can't get models to sit for me because it's social distancing so it would have been a great project to keep going with. Are you going to go back to it when you're... When oh absolutely, yeah. yeah I've got a whole slidey pile of magazine <laughs> <laughs> to go, just for research. Of course. Really for research, yeah. Okay I think we should probably move on to questions now. Um, there aren't any currently but if anybody has any questions and would like to type them into the chat box um like whilst everybody's busy doing that i just have one final question so if if in an imaginary world you could pick one person living or dead living or yeah living or dead um who you would love to sit for you who would it be you might not want to share this because you've kept your other identities quite secret but uh you know there's loads of like celebrities who you would know like you know strong women like Marianne Faithful or Sandy Powell or um but actually my work is it's sort of not about that um I get more excitement painting my friend's mum <laughs> than I do about who the person is in terms of their celebrity status I think a lot of my work is about not necessarily sexuality and gender but people who don't feel seen otherwise Mm -hmm. or whose um, visual appearance might be a reason for them to actually have a really hard time. You know, they might be judged on the way that they look. So I think, you know, traditionally portrait painting was for uh, a status symbol for people who were wealthy and powerful and could afford it. And actually, I think it, it adds gravitas to, you know, whoever the person is to have had their portrait painted in oil. So I'd rather give somebody deserving um, you know, that opportunity to shine. So whoever my next painting is, I will, that's who I want to paint. Good answer. <laughs> uh, we have a question now, actually. So Maureen Murray is asking, when you go back to painting after lockdown, do you think that lockdown will have influenced you in any way that will figure in your new work? 
Oh, that's really interesting. Um, well, I was painting something before lockdown, um, which I had hoped to finish and it, and it needs a bit more work. So I know what I will be painting and I need to continue on that. But I found this whole experience um, baffling and upsetting and distressing. And um, at the same time, there's been really lovely things that have come out of it. Like I've had time with my son that I wouldn't have had otherwise and actual time to do things. So I'll be interested to see who I am at the end, at the other side of this. But um, I, I imagine that my, my confidence has been knocked a little bit by what we're doing and just some of the awful things that people are having to go through. Um, so I think I might be a little bit more tentative, but um, hopefully it will, yeah, it will also add something. How soon do you think you'll be able to get back to your studio? I mean... Well, just as a little aside, um, Right as this thing was kicking off, I got a message from the person that I share my studio with um, to say that the building's being sold and that I will um, have to find a new studio as soon as, um, you know, things go back to normal. So I've got that lovely little thing waiting for me um, to sort out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that might that might impact on kind of whether I can just get back into working or not. But um yeah, I'd like to be able to go back in because I really, really miss it. And painting, the actual act of painting, not just what you're painting and what you end up with, is something that I realise I really need to do. And it takes me into another place where I just feel myself and I feel alive. And I, I really, really miss it. Um, so I can't wait to get back to that. Yeah. Um, we don't have any more questions. I don't know if anyone's got any more questions. If you have, if you want to type them in quickly or else you might have missed your moment. <laughs> um, I'm trying to look to see if I can see anyone that looks like they're typing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Okay. Um, Tom, Tom or Judy Moore says, it, it was so interesting to see all the dramatic detailed questions. Oops. Sorry, it's moving. Detailed costumes of some of your sitters, and then to hear you. T oh, this is a comment. And then to hear you talk about your self-portrait outfit with the same drama. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom or Judy. I really oh. appreciate that. And then they go on to say, "Can you talk a little more on this about the costumes? Um, about, I guess, about the the drama that you're applying to the costumes. Maybe I don't know. We might get more clarification." start start on that um well i mean one of the things that i'm interested in is just um in in terms of costume which i think is a really interesting word for clothing um meaning that you know you're sort of playing the part of a character is how i don't understand how clothing can be gendered i don't actually get that it's a piece of material and i think anybody should be free to wear whatever suits them and whatever they're in the mood to wear so often my work, you know, if it's got a provocative title like cross dresses, um, what I'm doing is just sort of looking at the kind of ridiculousness of binary identities and how it does seem to be constructed and reinforced by things like, um, you know, clothing and makeup and artificial trappings like that. I don't think it's down to identity. I think, yeah, um, I guess there's drama in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a question from Sarah Jane who says, Hi Sadie, many of your students at Heatherly's are interested in portraiture and are now working at home, brackets, exclamation mark. Any tips on how to stay focused in your own practice and also on how to self-generate ideas for portraits or figurative paintings? That's really interesting, yeah. I unfortunately am not able to um, paint from home so I can't quite relate to what they're going through. But um, I think... Um, don't worry if you are having some kind of block and you're feeling like you can't do it because I think um, paintings start in your head. I don't think that painting is something that you just do with your hands and your eyes. I think that you work out so much in your head and if you're not physically painting, you're generating new work because you're sort of um, experiencing things that are then going to find their way in. One way that I have tried to get back into things when I just can't think what to do is I've looked at um, classic images which I've been drawn to for some reason but I think that it might need a bit of a rework. So I've kind of done my own version of things like Manet's Olympia or even you know the sort of uh, Marlon Brando 
image and kind of changed it and reworked it. So I've used something as a starting point and then responded to it. And I think sometimes that can be quite a good way to sort of prompt you into making something that becomes a new piece of work, but is based on something in, already in existence. Mm. Keep your eyes open. Art just happens in front of your face all the time. So look for it as well as feel that you've got to kind of make it. We would have time for maybe one more question if there were one. We have Maureen Murray has come back just to say you seem like such a calm and delightful person that you must be marvellous to sit for. Oh, that's very nice. I think I'm really frightening to sit for because I always <laughs> people do things like suddenly strip down to their bra when they're not expecting it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one final question from Joe David who says, are you looking at art during lockdown? I look at very little else. <laughs> um, it's, keep, it's getting me through. Yes, I absolutely am hungry for what people are doing. Um, I unfortunately, well, I haven't actually um, been to any of the sort of uh, shows online, um, partly because, you know, I'm looking after an eight-year-old and, you know, I'm also teaching um, during this sort of remotely and trying to prepare for that alongside other things. But I know that there are a lot of really exciting shows and that you know you can still access things that are actually happening but i'm looking at um things like instagram and seeing what people are making um and people do seem to be sort of producing quite a lot of work it seems to be quite stimulating and of course people have got a lot of time um so i'm sort of keeping up to date with what other people are doing and um i've actually been making things out of fimo which is my kids sort of like, it's like little plasticine stuff because I'm so desperate to do something and that's all that there is in the house that, you know, I'm kind of desperate, it's coming out of me somehow. So yeah, watch out for that sideline. Oh, Joe's already seen those. Have you been? Oh, is nice. Yeah, they're I might even make one for Joe. <laughs> a little present. Oh. Okay, well, that brings us nicely to the end of our time. So I'd like to say, Firstly, a huge thank you to you, Sadie, obviously, for being here. And thank you to everyone on Zoom today. And thank you to all those people who are watching this recording later on. Um, oh, sorry, correction. That was Rachel, not Joe. You're going to have to change who you make your female. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also thank you to Heatherleys for a hosting and adapting to the current situation so that it's been possible to do these events online. Um, on which note I should do some advertising for them. So there's going to be in conversation events um, with me every fortnight. And the next one is going to be with Susie Hamilton talking about her paintings of COVID doctors, which will be on the 12th of June. And then that will be followed two weeks later by Graham Crowley and then Simon Davis. And then, um, who did I tell you before? James Lloyd. <laughs> that was it. Um, and then in alternate weeks, and then also in an conversation with me at the very end, you'll have the artist curators, Rosalind Davis and Justin Hibbs, and they'll be giving professional development talks starting next week at the same time with Rosalind, who will be focusing on um, creative strategies during COVID-19. So the event announcements will be going up on the Heatherly School page and also on the Thomas Heatherly Facebook page, along with the Zoom links. And I'm going to put those, um, share those, addresses now in case you haven't already got them bookmarked um, and also Sadie's Facebook page is there as well so thank you again everyone for attending and a huge virtual round of applause so I can see it happening already for Sadie um, and I hope to see you again soon thank you thanks so much thanks Anna and thanks Heather Lise.